I'm here uh, with a perspective of running three organizations focused on the future. Uh, the first is Singularity University up in Silicon Valley, in which we really are looking at one of the most powerful technologies on the planet, the technologies that are literally allowing an individual, a small team, to do what only governments and large corporations could do in the past. The power that we call it to create a 10 to the 9th plus impact, impact the lives of a billion people in a positive way. I know we have a number of SU alumni and faculty in the audience, so I welcome you. I'm here wearing the hat of uh, chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation, which has the, the basic notion that there is no problem on this planet that cannot be solved, period, bar none. It really is the focused intent of human innovation to go and solve those challenges. And then I serve as co-chairman of Planetary Resources, which is one of the companies on the cutting edge of how do we bring the resources of our cosmos to our service. If you think about it, the Earth is a crumb in a supermarket filled with resources. So I'm going to start actually off script because I am not one who, who believes in these dystopian futures. I'm someone who believes that we're heading towards an extraordinary future. And I want to take a moment to infect your minds with that meme, because I think it's very important. You know, we hear left, right, and center how the world is getting worse, how things are falling apart. You know, it's literally the result, as I, as I speak on stages around the world, that we're living in a day and age where our news media is a drug pusher, and negative news is their drug. And on every device that we get, our cell phones, our smartphones, our laptops, our newspapers, our radios, we are fed negative news 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over and over and over again. Because our minds on the plains of Africa, hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, evolved to pay far more attention to the negative news than the positive news. Because if we didn't pay attention to the negative news, we'd be out of the gene pool. You know, that rustle in the leaves wouldn't be the wind, it might be a tiger. And so our amygdala, an ancient part of our temporal lobe, literally screens everything we see and everything we hear looking for negative news. When we hear, we go, oh my god, what was that? We pay immediate attention, tenfold. Open any newspaper and look at the number, number of negative stories to positive stories. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. We also, as humans, are far better at seeing the negative dystopian futures than the positive ones. We see the dangers far, far away. But ultimately, we do have the power to solve them in advance, and we do over and over again. And if we look at the last hundred years of humanity, it's been an extraordinary century, right? The human lifespan has more than doubled. The per capita income of every nation on this planet has more than tripled. The cost of food has come down 13-fold, energy 20-fold, transportation 100-fold, communications over 1,000-fold. And that wasn't just good luck that happened, right? It wasn't political planning. It was the force of technology that enabled that future to literally skyrocket through the, through the cosmos. And guess what? Technology isn't slowing down. It's increasing at an exponential rate. And it's for that reason that I fundamentally believe we are living into an extraordinary time ahead. Back on my script now. <laughs> Thank you. So when I think about what's driving us in this area, it really is what I call compound, compounded convergent innovation. So innovation over time has been the exchange of ideas. You have an idea and I have an idea. We exchange ideas and we have you know, now have two ideas. And, and it's the building of my idea on your idea that allows us to really increase. But what people, I don't hear folks thinking about and talking about enough is where this ability to exchange ideas is progressing. Because it used to be that what drove innovation was people moving from rural areas into urban areas, right? And we're, we're growing towards a very rapid future of 50%, 75% of populations in urban areas. And when you're sitting next to each other, you can have conversations and exchange ideas. And all of that moves things forward. But what's happening now on top of that, the compounded nature of this, is that people around the world are becoming healthier and more literate. And that allows more and more people to have ideas and exchange their ideas. So you know, we have a couple of projects going on right now at the XPRIZE. We have something called the 
Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize, and with all due respect to Dr. Martin, while maybe you know maybe transporter beams and um, and warp speed isn't there yet, a lot of what what uh, Mr. Roddenberry created in Star Trek is in fact an exact roadmap for the future. And what we have in the tricorder here is the notion that you can build devices that are informational devices that any mom in the middle of Nigeria, in the middle of the Bronx, could have to diagnose herself or her child at 2 a.m. in the morning better than a board certified doctor. So we announced this competition. Qualcomm put up $10 million, actually $20 million, asking teams to build a handheld mobile device that you can speak to. It's got AI on the cloud. You can cough on it. It can do the RNA or DNA analysis of the pathogens in your sputum. You can do a micro blood prick. It can do your blood chemistry. And the notion is that for literally what is the plummeting cost of you know, everything approaching free, everyone will have access to abundant health care. We announced this competition at the XPRIZE Foundation, and we have now 300 teams around the world who have registered in the first year to compete for this. We expect a winner in the next three years. On top of that, we're getting ready this year with all, you know, with uh, my fingers crossed, to announce what could even be a more epic impact on the planet, a global literacy XPRIZE. There are 880 million illiterate people on the planet. And if we can create the software you know, this is diamond age. This is, you know, if we can create the software that a child who is completely illiterate can use to teach herself to read, and we're going to define literacy as coding as well, to read and to code, that would be transformative. So if all goes well, we'll be announcing this X Prize by the end of the year. And if you have a world of healthy and literate individuals, you have a world that's far more peaceful and a world that's far more innovative on every possible scale. Thank you. So where it gets interesting, though, is what happens next, right? Because what happens next, when you have a, a, a world that's healthy and literate and they're spending their time instead of gathering you know, all the, 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 they're scraping by and living, now those individuals Online, right? We had 2 billion people connect on the internet in 2010. That's going to grow to 5 billion people by 2020. Eric Schmidt just made a cryptic remark that he thinks all 7 billion will be on by 2020. We'll see what, what comes out of Google X from there. But if you have all these people now online, now they've got access to exponential tools. Now they've got access to cloud computing, AI, 3D printing, synthetic biology. And what kind of innovation occurs when you just don't have a few hundred thousand or a few million people, but you have billions of people attacking their problems with a tool set that only the greatest governments and philanthropists in the world had before? Now it gets interesting. So it doesn't stop there, of course, because what happens next after these people are connected is the true connection, what I like to call a meta-intelligence. And let me go off my normal script that I speak about in XPRIZE and SU and talk about what my view and theory of where we're going as a species is. So one of the things that you find in our universe is that patterns repeat. And when I look at what has been the pattern of life, it's very interesting because on our Earth, some four and a half billion years old, about a billion years after the Earth formed, three and a half billion years ago, the earliest life forms, prokaryotes, evolved. And these prokaryotes were very simple organisms, right? They were literally bags of cytoplasm with DNA floating inside them. And they reigned on this planet for the next billion and a half years. It was in about two billion years ago that the first eukaryotic life formed. And a eukaryotic life was essentially a single-celled organism, but with now technology embedded in it. When I say technology, what do I mean? These eukaryotic life forms brought into them, in a, in a uh, symbiotic form, mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi apparatus. And these were basically organelles that enabled that single-cell life form to manipulate energy more efficiently, proteins more efficiently, information more efficiently. It had a, now a nuclear, um, you know, a, a nucleus to contain its DNA. It, it ended up with mitosis for better processing of information. And so we went from prokaryotic life, very simple life forms, to eukaryotic life, life incorporating, if you would, biological technology into it. The next step was that this eukaryotic life became multicellular life forms. It happened about a billion years later. 
So we go from single cell complex technology enabled life to multicellular life forms. What happened next was the rapid evolution to where about 500 million years uh, ago, half a billion years after the, the multicellular life form, we had the first simple animals. And then, you know, a million or so years ago, us. And what are we? We are a collection of 10 trillion cells. Right? Your body has 10 trillion cells in it, each of them a living organism, each of them in service of the others, each of them that make up you as a consciousness. And when I think about where we are in this, this epic formation of humanity, I put us at the prokaryotic stage. We are those simple life forms, each individual, each simple in our capability, on the verge of incorporating technology into our being. On the verge of incorporating technology, the brain-computer interface, whatever form it might take, the technology that maybe some of you have in you already, whether it's artificial valves or hip replacements or, or corneal adjustments, whatever it might be, we're just at the very beginning of that incorporation of technology into our being. But what happens next, going from the prokaryotic to the eukaryotic, is then the beginning of a multicellular life form. And as we begin to plug into the internet, as we begin to plug in through optogenetics or cortical implants, whatever it might be, and become a multicellular life form, this is where it gets interesting. This is where, for me, I see the future going. Because as I see us transitioning from literally the prokaryotic form of life to the multicellular form of life, I see us coming online as a meta-intelligence. Because I think that as we start to interconnect our consciousness, our beings, who we are, we're going to start to become conscious at yet another level. And that next level, you know, whether it looks something like this, is what I believe is the ultimate form of our evolution. Because I think when we become conscious, interconnected, as a meta-intelligence, we're going to look out into this cosmos and see many other meta-intelligences out there. You know, this is an image taken by, um, by the Hubble Deep Field uh, instrument that looked in the darkest part of the sky. And every image you see there, I think except for one, is a galaxy. Right? So we're living in a, in a galaxy of 100 billion stars, in a universe of 100 billion galaxies, and we may have an infinite number of universes, but that's a different conversation. And we're just beginning. We're just at the very beginning of reaching out there. And so I think that as a species, we are heading towards um, becoming conscious on a cosmic level as we begin to share our thoughts. And one of the things that will come out of this, this, in, this meta-intelligence, this interconnectedness that we have, I think is an extreme form of global peace. Because just like you don't take a knife and stab your own arm, even though each of those cells in your arm is in itself its own individual life form, I think as we become more and more interconnected, more and more interdependent, more and more transparent with our actions, our desires, our thoughts, that a normal consequence of that is going to be, again, as you are as a human species, an individual. So one of the other thoughts I think about is that we have, during this time, the ability and, in fact, the obligation to back up our biosphere. Everything that we know of human is here, everything, right there. We have uh, my good friend Richard Garriott over here, uh, one of my trustees and early founders at the X Prize, who traveled up to space and had a chance to see this image, as some 550 people on the planet have so far, hopefully many of you in the, in the decades ahead. But think about it. Just like the Library of Alexandria burned and lost all of that, imagine if we were to have a, you know, a catastrophic event here, whether it's an asteroid, a virus, whatever it might be. We have a moral obligation to back up this biosphere. And I think we have the ability, finally, to actually do that. And the way I think about that, again, in biological terms, is the budding of our planet. So we have collected in our internet all of the sum total, or a lot of the sum total of knowledge which can, in fact, be duplicated and put on. We now have the ability to go into the forest of the Amazon and actually get the DNA sequence of every insect, animal, plant life on this, on this planet. We have the ability during our lifetimes right now to actually catalog life on this planet and back it up off the planet. And I think that is an extraordinary 
um, if you would, uh, responsibility that we bear during these next few decades. When I think about what's going to fuel humanity in our exponential growth off this planet, it's going to be resources. And uh, one of the companies that I've had the uh, honor to co-found with another good friend, Eric Anderson, is a company called Planetary Resources, which looks at the notion that our cosmos, again, is filled with resources, resources that will sustain our continuous growth off this planet. Sometimes those resources come barreling down on the Earth. Uh, this was the uh, impact in uh, Chebolinsk uh, on, in February of last year. Uh, this had the impact of some 30 uh, Hiroshima bombs as it exploded over the skies at that day. Um, and of course, uh, we have, we're living in a, in a cosmos that is filled with these resources. 1.5 million rocks that we know of over a kilometer in size some 600,000 that we know of um, that come near the Earth, and some 600 million that orbit the Sun. But when I look at these in a different light, uh, they're very valuable. As it turns out, you know, a 75-meter carbonaceous chondrite asteroid, uh, you know, smaller than the size of this room, or about the size of this room, has more hydrogen and oxygen on it then was used to fuel all 135 space shuttle missions. So think of these as orbiting gas stations, if you would, to fuel our continued expansion. And a 500 meter uh, uh, LL chondrite has more platinum ever mined in the history of humanity. Of course, when you're in space, the nickel and iron is going to be much more interesting to you than the platinum, but uh, the platinum will actually fuel the economic growth as we move forward. I give uh, one fun example of what drives uh, our investors in this is uh, this one asteroid, 2011 UW-158. Uh, if you add up the current market value, it's about a $5 trillion asteroid. It comes by the Earth every two years, conveniently. <laughs> and uh, it's definitely at the top of our list as an asteroid that we're going to be going out. If I haven't mentioned, the company Planetary Resources is a company looking to identify visit, claim, and ultimately mine these asteroids to bring back materials to Earth. We're building these ARCID space telescopes. We're in production of these right now. The name ARCID, by the way, uh, is from the Star Wars universe. It was the name of the company that built the Imperial probe droids. Um, and so we're mass producing these, these, uh, uh, these space telescope buses. And these are the actual spacecraft that will be going out to the asteroids. Uh, they'll be going out and a, a, a flotilla of about a half a dozen to each asteroid. Uh, they, use, they have onboard lasers for turning around back at the Earth and communicating data back to the Earth, and actually using the laser as well to actually vaporize part of the asteroid to look at the spectral analysis. So really very complex, state-of-the-art uh, spacecraft that we're going uh, to be flying. And uh, we're actually going to be launching the first one of this for public use. We launched a, a Kickstarter campaign uh, to make one of these space telescopes. For those of you who have supported the campaign, it's midway through. Thank you for that. We're going to be actually making, you know, a friend of mine, Jason Silva, called it, we're extending the optic nerve of humanity. So we're at a point in time where imagine having these kinds of space telescopes out through the cosmos that any school kid could go and control and look at and look through. We truly are living in an extraordinary time, a time in which the technology that individuals have to impact the world is being democratized, right? The cost of things are being demonetized, and everything is being democratized. We have more and more people coming online with this powerful technology. We are extending human reach beyond the, you know, any limitations we possibly had. And for me, we're, the rate of innovation on this planet is going to skyrocket.